Well, it's off the press, and who are still on the breakfast? We have Okunabo on Kataria, who joins us via phone. Good morning, Okunabo. It's good to have you join us this beautiful Monday morning. Good morning, and good morning, Nigeria. All right, then uh, let's take a look at the punch as made available by a paper vendor. The PDP challenges Tunubu again, APC says, as Shiwaju will floor Atiku. One hour interview. Uh, some Nigerians are saying, hey, we need to go that way. Tunubu should subject himself to a one-hour interview. Atiku campaign insists Atiku incapable of defeating anybody. He has nothing to offer. APC spokesman is quoted. So there's a back and forth. And you also have a picture uh, of those kidnapped train passengers who were flogged. And you can see them uh, sadly seated. Outrageous terrorists flog train abductees and threaten uh, to abduct uh, or kidnap the president and the Kaduna state governor, amongst other uh, prominent Nigerians. Again, you find financial crisis, NCAA audits distress airlines. And marginal fields operators may earn 4 trillion naira annually. Blackout looms as electricity workers join NLC protests. Let's not forget the NLC saying, hey, we're going to embark on a solidarity protest on the 26th and the 27th. The government, on the other hand, has said this is illegal. And then you also have another response from Fallon saying everyone has a right to, you know, expression or an association. Uh, as to strike, varsity unions back NLC and pro-lecturers protests. But will that change anything? What's the implication of all of that? Would the government blink an eye lead? Uh, in security, agric imports exceeds export by 443 billion naira and reps summons ministers BPE over power plant sale. Another caption says 367,499 applied for 43,717 medicine slot. Uh, jam reports. Lassa fever, cholera kills 240 experts express worry. Just as we are, uh, you know, having or experiencing an increase in COVID cases. Registered voters hit 7 million in Lagos. This is what INEC is reported to say. Removal of subsidy, NMPC and ports monopoly will end queues. Marketers are quoted to say. And hypertensive man dies as bribe chasing last man. Men sees vehicle. We must perform a billionaire brother tells governor elect. Uh, uh, that's what it is this morning. Well, that's the much we can take on the punch newspaper. We turn our attention from the punch. We have the nation on the nation security on red alert over threat to Buhari Erufai. Mm. Train attack, insurgents threaten to attack president and Kaduna governor. Government won't succumb to propaganda, says presidency. Victim families protest today. Uh, well, the president is saying that this is actually a you know, global tool that's been used by terrorists globally to force government to do the beatings. Uh, another question that people are asking, you know, is, is government not doing the beating already of a terrorist? DMO explains soaring debt servicing vote and Ipman on why petrol queues persist. Demand more than supply. Again, you find NDLA arrest eight in Lagos, Abuja, Enugu airports. And that's it on uh, the Nation newspaper. We turn our attention from the Nation and we uh, quickly look at the Guardian newspaper. Consumer firms brace for higher price amid energy crisis. OPS says production costs by up by almost 100%. Manufacturers side dwindling capacity utilization, inventory, and profitability. Uh, telecoms. Uh, you also have diesel hike forces companies to review workforce, says Food Union. You lingering fuel shortage undermining listed firms' growth will impact half year financially. Well, that, that's a lot uh, that's going on following, you know, the energy crisis, the petrol issues and what have you. Uh, train attack shock as terrorists vow to kidnap or kidnap Buhari Elfai. It's quite shocking. Is it shocking, really? 
IPOP tax federal government on unconstitutional release of Kanu, especially when you have the United Nations weighing in on this particular one. I mean, they're saying, hey, the government, uh, you know, Kenya, all those involved should should actually pay uh, compensating for not following due process to extradite Namdi Kanu. Multiple unconnected third parties collaborate at Tiku's position on Tunubu and Dufai in federal government confirms 16 new cases of monkeypox from 12 states. It calls for a lot of consent. I mean, we're grappling with a lot. The issue now is, do we have the capacity health-wise, uh, you know, to cater for all of these uh, viruses and diseases that uh, the world is plagued with? Uh, gunmen kill eight persons, abduct others in Plateau Katsina, and delegates collected money to vote at primary, says Amechi. Interesting. Well, that's it on The Guardian. And just before we have opened the bond, Kataria joined the conversation on a daily independent newspaper. Banks steadily yielding digital banking space to fintechs. I'm sure you want to find out what that means. Implementation of renegotiated agreement will end strike. Mm, that's what Asu is saying. Orange Telecom vows to enter Nigeria's big markets. It's quite uh, something different. Equity elections, Sarap's use INEC for failing to prosecute vote buyers. Seven million voters so far registered in Lagos. Is it impressive? And you have how aero contractors, $3 million deposit for aircraft was diverted. Could it be the reason for the back and forth? You have another interesting caption, the PDP crisis, how are you Obasaki Tambowal worked against Wiki's vice president candidacy. And Naimet once again flawed in Taraba and Southwest. Of course, Naimet has been on top of the issue, but what's government doing? I mean, what's the government? It's okay for us to have an information, but what's the action? Are we being proactive or waiting to be, uh, you know, for things to happen before we then begin to respond as the reactive people that we have always been? Train attack victims, uh, we won't yield to terrorist propaganda, presidency is quoted to say. And that's it this morning on the Daily Independence and on the papers. Let's have open the bond, Kataria. Uh, share his thoughts this morning. Once again, we appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Well, uh, let's start off with the one that's very dominant. Of course, it would constitute the crux of our conversation. It's the video that was viral. Uh, where we see terrorists uh, torturing, uh, flogging uh, train passengers that were kidnapped. And, of course, the threat on the president and other prominent Nigerians, including the Kaduna state governor. I mean, how do you respond to this? Are you shocked? Well, there is there is so, there is so much hold back. So much hold back. Uh, what what's the question again? If I see the headline, the problem, I know what's the question again? So, so much hold back. Well, um, I'm I'm asking, what's your reaction to the video that has been viral as regards uh, terrorists meting torture on the kidnapped victims? I mean, those who were kidnapped, the trained passengers who are still in captivity of this terrorist, and the okay, fact that I they're I also did, threatening if the I president. Clearly, you are talking of the video that went viral. Yes, please. In which uh, the terrorists are being touched, uh, the uh, victims are being touched, the abductees, is it? Exactly. Okay. Uh, well, it, it, it's so sad. Um, honestly, it, that is depressing, tribulating to watch that video. But it goes to underscore the fact that we have a government floundering in the morass of leadership vacuity. We have a government that is quite insensitive simply because probably their siblings, children, or relatives are not part of their abductees. And so the government is not bothered at all I strongly believe that if Buhari's relation or one of the service chiefs had their relatives there, 
the deputy would have done something. But the government has failed in its duty to protect lives and property that it ought to so do. Because it is the principal and major cardinal responsibility of a government. But sadly, we have a government in power that is highly complicit. And when I say highly complicit, I have my facts. First and foremost, recently in the north, we had a situation where a man that was declared wanted by the government, a terrorist declared wanted by the government, was survived in the north. In the full care of security chiefs. And the president is also aware. Today is an honor, or whatever it is. And the north. And this was somebody that was declared wanted. You also have a situation where, but now I look at what happened in another state. I think recently where people they said went for a wedding or something. Look at what happened. But you are confirming somebody that has just been declared wanted. And still on the wanted list. I mean, it's a government of double speak. You know? Uh, a government that, uh, how will I put it? I don't know, my dear. It, it's, I'm so pained that, I mean, after watching that video, that I, I, I resolved and I said to myself, we don't have a country anymore. It's more or less like a banana republic. It's a failed state. And at this point, I think we have to defend ourselves. Because we don't without license. Because I will not sit down in my house and allow a madman to just come and make barbecue of me and members of my family without any resistance. Even if I have to die, I have to resist and not die like a coward. So I don't think anybody needs license anymore to get a gun. Well, we have to, the government has still, we have to protect ourselves. Mm. Those people are in the rain and under the sun. Tortured on daily basis. We're not just talking of psychological torture. We're talking of physical torture. And you have a, a president that is blood-tracking, sleeping, we start a change of conscience as if nothing is happening in this country. What are the service chiefs who embezzled the funds meant for the procurement of arms and ammunition to fight this war? Who oh, are made ambassadors? Well, what do you then? This much, even the NSA said that the money that you allocated could not be accounted for. The NSA said it. Then you have the same former service chief of Afghanistan who said the war was the war against the war not the last for uh, 20 more years. He has more facts than he did. He knows, he, he knows why he said that. He knows. He has the facts. And rather he was being rewarded with an ambassadorial appointment. Are you calling this a country? The government is highly complicit. Highly. Where is Gumi today? Nothing. Gumi himself, after Mr. President said that they were going to wipe out terrorism. What did Gumi say? His response. With 24 hours after, Gumi said, no, it was not possible that they have to negotiate or else terrorism will continue. It's a record. Where is Gumi? So we have a government that is dead and he's going like this. Completely in terms of protection of lives and property. Okay. Open Katara, let's move away from that now, uh, as we will definitely look into it as we proceed in the course of the conversation. I mean, it's just quite worrisome for a lot of people, and some people say it's quite embarrassing where you have this terrorist uh, threatening to kidnap the number one citizen, 
the commander in chief of the armed forces of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. I mean, really, <laughs> I really don't know. But on the Punch newspaper, a uh, one hour interview, the PDP challenges uh, Tunubu again, and APC says a Siwaju will floor a Tiko. Uh, the question here is you have this political uh, you know, stakeholders now, the uh, elite, those who are actually at the forefront for 2023. Do you think this interview impacts in any way? This, does this uh, make any sense? I mean, having an interview uh, just before the elections, ahead of the elections with this contestant, does it, you know, change the course of things? Does it, you know, reflect uh, or impact differently on the choice or the decision of the electorate? Are you, are you saying, are you, sorry, is she not true? Are you asking if the security situation? No, that, that's, on on the that's on the other hand. That's on the other hand. That was on the one side. I'm talking about the punch now. Oh. We're away from security issues. Uh, we're talking about, uh, you know, 2023 elections. And you have this dominant parties, the PDP and the APC, the challenge for an interview. Now, the question here is, does this impact or does this, you know, help in any way uh, to help the electorate with their choices? Merci. Like I said, there's a lot. Let's do the breakfast and plus TV Africa off the press. And we have Okunabon Katara, who's still with us via phone this morning. Okunabo, thank you so much for staying with, with us uh, once you, again. All right, and was, we're yeah, looking yeah. at the Punch newspaper just before that timeout, and uh, the question or the concern here is about the one-hour interview that you have the PDP challenging the uh, APC flag bearer too. I mean, and there's a back and forth with the APC and the PDP. APC is saying that Ashiwaju will floor Tiko. Now, I'm asking, at the end of the day, is there any... Uh, significance for the electorate? Does this help them in any way uh, with the choice of who they elect as president or as governor? These interviews, do they have any significance? Yeah, Open the book, can you Sorry. hear me? Yeah, the, 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 the summary is are you, are you in the question on who will win in the forthcoming election? That's not it. I'm asking, is there any importance for this interview? Does this, you know, in any way impact on the electorate and their choice at the end of the day? That's the interview. Okay. If you're talking about the, the effect of the interview on the electorate. Exactly. You know? Oh, I see. Okay. And... Uh, well, I don't think so. I don't think so because uh, right now, of course, what we expect is uh, castigations will definitely go on. I mean, it's the characteristics of politics, especially when you approach the crunch time. It's normal for uh, contestants, contenders to try as much as they can to be advertised, so to speak. Their opponents. I said so they will say all kinds of things. Truth, falsehood, everything will be dispensed at their disposal just to ensure victory, just to demonize their opponents, and to a very large extent create an impression in the minds of the electorate that they are the best and their opponents and their opponents are not good enough. So I don't think that a very large extent will affect the voting pattern of Nigeria. First and foremost, let me tell you, most Nigerians have made up their minds on who they are going to vote in the forthcoming general election. Out of, let's say, 100 percent, um, media advertorials, castigations, and so on, could just sway Maybe just 5% or maybe or less than 5%. Because those that will vote for Atiku have made up their mind they are going to vote for Atiku. Those that will vote for Tinibu have made up their mind they are going to vote for Tinibu. Those that will vote for P2B have made up their mind they are going to vote for P2B. And that is the case. 
And don't forget that in this in this part of the world, our electorate believes so much in investing scholarship. Not necessarily what the candidate can offer or the stuff they are made of, but simply because their political godfathers have said this is a direction. And that is what happens. Now you have just few independent minded persons. And even the few independent minded persons already have an opinion of all the candidates. And that will inform their decision at the polls. So I don't think this interview would in any way affect the outcome of the election. Okay, but okay, I, I mean, we're at the verge where we say that our democracy is still very nascent, and we constantly would say that there's need for us to ask for accountability. Don't you think that this would also be a means where um, these elite or those who vie for political office can be held accountable, especially when you have this debate with the opposition or whoever it is and those who are contending, those in the race? It would be a time where uh, we would hear their thoughts on different policies and how they are able to, what, what they intend to, uh, you know, uh, bring on the table for the people. Don't you think that this is also a means of holding these persons accountable and, you know, where people can scrutinize them? A means of accountability. Talking of accountability, I, 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 oh my God, this whole matter. Are you, are you saying that, that um, the antecedents will count? I'm the asking. The antecedents will vote based on the antecedents or? I'm, I'm, honestly, I can hardly hear you. Okay, so open the if you can hear me. My question is, don't you think that this would actually go a long way in developing our democracy where we constantly have clamored and asked for um, some sort of accountability, holding our leaders accountable? This is a time where they have to, uh, you know, tell us what it is that they are bringing to the table and how much, you know, we get to see the how and when and, you know, what they intend to do at the end of the day. It's just a means to hold them accountable and scrutinize, you know, uh, their candidacy. No, when you talk of scrutinizing the candidate, like I said, if you talk of a Tinibu, we all know who a Tinibu is. He's been a governor. So we all know what he did as a governor. If you talk of an Atiku, we all know who Atiku is. If you talk of um, a P2B or a Kwakwa show, these are known figures with antecedents. So definitely, even before you make your choice, two things will inform your, your choice. One, the antecedents of the candidates, scrutiny. You are going to carry, do an appraisal of the candidate. Then number two, you are talking about your political godfather. These are the two major, like a lot of people now talk of PTOB because they believe that as a governor, he was quite prudent. That's why a lot of them say, let us go for PTOB. Then some are saying, oh, let it be an article. Because as vice president of the country, the economy was within its purview. And it performed excellently well. Then if you talk of volatility, to some, they say in Lagos he did well. But unfortunately for volatility, he belongs to the APC that has failed weakly in the last seven years. And that is that will rub up on him, whether he likes it or not. Although I always have this argument that people should not be judged based on their political parties, because in Nigeria, the political parties don't have ideologies. Unlike a civilized land, in Nigeria, the political parties have ideologies, and as a candidate of that political party, you are there to do what the party says and not what you want. But in Nigeria, it is a candidate that dictates to the party what it wants. So they are different. So if a Buarima is very bad as a leader, and a Tidibu very good as a leader, because the party does not have ideology. I don't say that. But in this country, if you go out to ask questions, they will tell you APC has failed. APC has failed. APC has failed. I think mean, that is the case. Definitely, most of them might not want to vote for APC. 
because they might not appreciate the distinction between the party and the candidate in this country. So all these are the things that will be taken under advisory, which in itself is a scrutiny, which in itself is an appraiser of the candidates. All right. Um, but just before we move away from that, we still have uh, more interesting headlines. And removal of subsidy, NMPC imports monopoly uh, and skew. This is what marketers are saying that uh, with the removal of or removal of subsidy, NMPC imports monopoly will end queues. Uh, do you think that that's it? Do you think that this is this will become a thing? Well, I, I rule out something. I don't think so. Because we are the parents are not one. Yes, if you talk of the queue, okay, fine, because uh, to a very large extent, it might not necessarily be controlled by just the federal government, but it's by the electoral, by the, by the act. The federal government is still more or less like the holding company. It will still dictate what will happen for now, at least for now. And if you have to NPLQ, the government has to be sincere. We must maintain our refinery, resuscitate and maintain our refinery. That is the only way. So that we don't export the crude and import the finished products, which is extremely ridiculous and cannot be justified. Because when you talk of the import cost of importation, the uh, both upstream, midstream, and downstream cost, definitely these prices will go up. And when these prices go up, the microservices you are making their million, they will sell. But then, once you have shown hiccup, in the international uh, arena, it will definitely lead to a queue again. Not necessarily suppose it's because of the European war. No. Those that are involved in the importation put into consideration their cost and they create artificial scarcity in order to increase prices. That is just what is going on. Artificial scarcity. To increase prices. Otherwise, I see that if we have our refineries working, we won't be having queues. That is the panacea. We must get our refineries working. That is the only remedy to this issue of queues that has become perennial under this administration. Okay, but um, open the bank, Tara. We 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 have always talked about getting our refineries functioning. Uh, we also know that there's some turnaround maintenance that goes on with the refineries that we already have. And is it that we don't understand that we need to get the refineries functioning? Is it is it a function of knowledge no, we, that we no, lack knowledge? Nothing we do. The no. truth is, you have just a microscopic field benefiting from it. First and foremost, you come around and tell us, you know how much is being voted. And at the end of the day, nothing is done. It's a cabal, a cartel. They don't share the money. So my question and is... is because it, it, the Minister for Petroleum, who is the president himself, is not bothered. Sorry, what is this something? So, it, so is, is the, the issue here is, is not that we, we don't know that we need the refineries to function. No, we know. But if, but if the refineries are working... Majority, Nigerians are going to be the beneficiaries, but to the detriment of the cabal that is now making abnormal profit from the importation of the finished products. That's all. So there is every effort to transfer. No, I the announcement is that monies are voted for the turnaround maintainers of those refineries. And sadly, you have how many people working in NFC? And at, at the end of every month, how much is being paid to maintain them in terms of salaries, allowances, uh, and what have you? So, as far as the petroleum sector is concerned, the government is completely wasteful. 
completely well so. Now that like, has been privatized. When it, when the privatization will fully take effect, when the government will cease to be like more or less like the holding company, you will see that even though the price of petrol might go up, but because it is more or less now like a private thing, we are not going to have shortage of petrol anymore. Unless those that are going to be involved will want to be... You so they cannot afford it. They have to make profit. They have to make profit. But right now, because it's a federal government thing, it belongs to nobody in particular. You have a few making a fortune. It's, like, it's a concrete fight. It's seen as a concrete fight, and the government is doing nothing about it. In fact, the government is complicit. How will you defend somebody that is not doing anything? You export crude, then import the finished product. Meanwhile, almost every two years or thereabouts, you vote a billions of naira for turn around maintenance. They don't, they don't maintain it. Because if they are maintaining, we will be refining here in this country. They don't be maintaining. So we, so, so we so understand. The government is equally complicit. Mm. And in how many years now, the president has been the substantive minister of the Senate. Mm. From 1977. Yes. All right. L let's move away from that issue so we understand why we're not making progress. It's not because we don't have knowledge about what we should do, uh, but, you know, there's no willpower there, and we understand that corruption might just be at the front burner. And then you have a president who's saying, hey, corruption is, you know, top on the list, and we're going to, uh, you know, uh, squash corruption at the end of the day. Uh, but that's not even the case. So we quickly look at this one just before we call it a wrap this morning on the paper uh, review. IPOP tax the federal government on unconditional release of Kanu, and that's it. And uh, it's on the Guardian newspaper. Now, the United Nations Human Rights Council uh, had also said that Nigeria was wrong to unlawfully arrest and torture and continue to detain the leader of the indigenous people of Biafra, that's Namdi Kanu. And the UN bodies also uh, talked about, you know, Kenya, the fact that he had asked the Nigerian government to immediately release Kanu unconditionally. What do you make of this now? Uh, the UN, it feels like we're always very keen about well, the international not, bodies. Now that IPOP is asking for uncondi unconditional release, uh, we already know what it is that he was unlawfully arrested and detained. Uh, do you think that the government would you know, blink a lead, an eye lead. I don't, I don't think the government will release Kano unconditionally. Why? And uh, in all fairness, too, you don't expect a government to release uh, a man that is seen as a threat to the unity of the country unconditionally. Because it's political now. Yes, he was uh, arrested illegally, no doubt about that. But my greatest worry or concern is that the tempest of justice must not be allowed, must not blow quickly. In other words, what is good for the bulls is also good for the Ganda. You have a Kano there, and Kano is being treated the way he's treated simply because he's from the Southeast. I just thought of a terrorist who has been turbaned just how many, about uh, two weeks ago, a week ago, and enough, a man that was declared wanted in the full glare of the DSS, police, army, and co, he was turbaned. And the government is doing nothing about that. Still on the wanted list. Not that he has been pardoned. He's in, in turbaned. Meanwhile, there is a kind of indication. And you have a president who said, let the courts decide the state. But the president did not say, let the court decide the state of the matter that has been provided. And that is why people are saying, let this man go. You can negotiate. That's why I say it must not be unconditional. You can negotiate. If we release you, you have to go back to talk to your people to end the madness in the Southeast, which is actually a function of segregation discrimination and marginalization by the federal government. 
Well, uh, open up. Well, you can make a shot and tell them to ask you to go and talk. The another so, said, Governor, too, said even when he met with him in prison, the man was willing to renounce all form of, uh, 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 all form of, uh, how would I put, uh, hostilities. Okuna Bank uh, we have to go now, but just before we go, I I'd like to just leave this here as part of what you said. You talked about the fact that Nabdi Khan is a threat to the unity of the people. I mean, is there anything wrong that the, a, a group of persons would ask that they want to become a republic? I mean, asking for a referendum. Okay? Is, no, no, is there anything no, no. wrong? No. Um, um, mm -hmm. Sir, please. Not I, I see my no, no, you said you, that, you that, that he's a threat. That I mean, when you say threat. something is a threat, when you say something is a threat, then, you know, it's a threat. The, the, we're talking about rights right here. Don't uh, the people, I mean, don't I have a right to wake up and say, hey, I want to become, a, uh, you know, a federation. I, I don't want to become part of this. Especially when we look at, you know, the 100th centurion, uh, you know, when we click that, or when we clock that particular 100 years, amalgamation, uh, the document that brought us together, you know, in, in, in 2014, you know, had expired. And so some people say that this entity is almost illegal. Don't people have a right to say, hey, we don't want to become and we want a referendum. Is there anything wrong? Is that really a threat or people have a right to it? Especially when people, I mean, the government or the people not paying attention to the concerns of these individuals or a group of peasants who are saying, this is what the problem is. Have we paid attention to it? But I know that it's a conversation for another day, and I know that you are willing to answer, but we need to go open a bonka tire. We'll definitely talk about this. Oh, uh, oh I wanted to respond to that. I know, I know, but let's let's talk about this, you know, some other time. I'll probably okay, off okay, air okay, right now. You. Thank you so okay, much. Okay, it's always you. a delight to Thank um, have you, you on morning. the show. Sorry for the whole back. Sorry for the whole back. No, no, it's it's that's not on you. We take uh, full responsibility. Technical issues. Thank you so much. Okay. okay. All right then. And that's the size on off the press. But quickly, this is a fantastic news. I mean, in all of this, we need to celebrate our big wins. Uh, Toby Amosun is the first Nigerian athlete in history to set the world record in any event as she's just recently won 12 point. One, two seconds in 100 meters hurdles. I mean, we're talking about a gold medal here. And that's a good one. Toby Amosun, we're proud of you. And we say congratulations. Amosun, thank you. We're proud of you. And uh, we look forward to, you know, greater wins. It probably might just be the very first, you know, uh, medal that we're getting right there, if I'm not mistaken. But that's it this morning on Off the Press. And we take a break. When we return, it will be time for us to have a first major conversation. But just before then, let's tell you what happened today in history, being the 25th day in the month of July. Stay with us. <laughs>